Hi guys, since you have now been through chapter 8 and where we've talked about chromosomal variation, we're going to jump right into chapter 10, which um, is talking about the chemical nature of the gene. So we're going to be talking, spending a lot of time talking about the different components that make up DNA. And just realize that that material that is associated with the DNA structure has to have four major characteristics. It has to contain very complex information in the form of our um, bases. It has to replicate very faithfully and um, on a regular basis. The genetic material must also encode the, uh, the phenotype. And it has to have the capacity to vary to, um, to take on new roles as evolution plays a part in the production. So DNA is uh, a polymer, which means that it is a structure that has various characteristics. Um, more specifically, it's going to have a structure at three different levels, primary, secondary, and tertiary. The primary structure of DNA is what you're probably most familiar with. So this polymer is going to link nucleotides together via phosphodiester linkages. So the nucleotide material is going to be bonded through those phosphodiester linkages. And a nucleotide is a um, bigger category that is made up of three different base or three different components a phosphate group a sugar group and a base group so the nitrogenous bases um, are what we refer to as a g c and t and these really give the specific designation to dna and are going to um, build that roadmap for the various processes that take place in species so the um, nitrogenous bases can be further categorized into either purines or pyrimidines. Our purines are going to be adenine and guanine, whereas our pyrimidines are going to be cytosine, thiamine, and uracil. Uracil is important because it is actually going to be present in RNA material, but not DNA material. So that's one clue that you have. If you look at a set of sequences and you see a U instead of a T, that, that means that you know that you're dealing with RNA and not DNA. So these bases um, look very different in structure. Our purines have a, a two ring structures, where our, whereas our pyrimidines are a simpler structure with only one ring. And our purines always are going to pair with our pyrimidines. More specifically, adenine, our purine, is going to pair with thiamine, our pyrimidine. And their bonding is going to be... Um, or the linkage between those two nucleotides or those bases is going to occur through hydrogen bonding, but more specifically two hydrogen bonds. So A and T are bonded by two hydrogen bonds. Uh, on the other side of that coin is um, guanine and cytosine. So again, first of all, we know that we're dealing with DNA because we have T in the structure and not U. But our guanine and our cytosine is are going to be uh, the purine and the pyrimidine respectively, and they're actually going to bond by three hydrogen bonds. So the number of bonding between the bases um, actually does change, and is and it was made or um, it was designed that way for specificity in the genome. As we move towards secondary structure, we're really going to start talking about the three-dimensional configuration or the double helical structure. And the double helix is going to be a configuration that is present in an anti-parallel fashion. So each DNA strand has a five prime end and a three prime end. And they're going to be opposite of one another. So if the top of the DNA strand is a five prime, then the bottom of the DNA strand is a three prime. Okay, so keep in mind that a singular DNA strand means... Um, is you can visualize this by breaking the hydrogen bond. So we have one strand here and a second strand here. So that five to three prime direction actually will dictate that anti-parallel nature. So um, DNA is going to be um, uh, 
is going to be in a configuration with either the five prime or the three prime um, end at the top and the opposite of that at the bottom. And then that, oops, sorry, that uh, same configuration is going to be the opposite on the opposite strand. So in this example, on the strand that is on the most left in this figure, we've got the five prime structure up here um, at the top, or at the top. That means three prime is at the bottom. However, opposite of that, the rightmost strand starts with a three prime end of the DNA at the top and the five prime down here at the bottom. So they are anti parallel in configuration. Keep in mind, our A's are going to bond to our T's via two hydrogen bonds, and our G's are going to bond to our C's via three hydrogen bonds. Secondary structure in a more of a model figure actually has this appearance. So if we look over here to the right at our first figure, we can actually see DNA in a double helix structure in a major groove and a minor groove. So the minor groove is going to be where the base is actually linked together via hydrogen bonding. And as the helical structure begins to form that uh, secondary um, that secondary double helix, you are going to see um, a major groove form, which is the actual uh, rolling or twisting of the groove. And that's a little more clear in this figure to the left, where we have a... Uh, minor groove where bonding is taking place and then we have a major groove which is where the twisting is going to happen. One of the last points that I want to make really quickly is about DNA methylation. So this process is very important um, in the ability of genes to be turned on and turned off. So a bacteria um, is actually going to be the organism that is either adding or taking away a methane group to the DNA structure. And what um, is thought that this does from an evolutionary perspective is um, to protect the DNA from a virus attack. Methylation occurs most often on cytosine bases and the degree of methylation is going to be very different depending on what species you're talking about. So no methylation takes place in yeast, about 5% of total methylation takes place in animals, and 50% in plants. So the process of DNA methylation may actually prevent the transcription process from taking place. So here on this last slide, I just want you guys to get more familiar with how DNA um, appears in a model structure. So DNA in this figure is going to be um, the green and blue structures, where the green structure is going to be our sugar phosphate backbone in a double helix form. You can kind of see it turn into a helix there. And the blue structures are going to be where the um, hydrogen or the hydrogen bonds are actually attaching the bases to one another. And then this red and orange confetti-like material on the outside of the DNA structure, those are proteins, different types of proteins. So the proteins are going to be tightly associated with the DNA material at all times. So it could help with structure, stability, or it could be so that those proteins are in close proximity when it gets the signal to go through cell reproduction or um, uh, transcription and translation or DNA replication as well. So these proteins can be anything like ribosomes, or they could be enzymes that are going to cut DNA, um, lots of different things. So just realize that actually in um, real life situations, proteins and DNA are very, very close to one another. All right, so now that um, we have been through very briefly through Chapter 8 material, make sure to um, read Chapter 8 and do your prep lecture, and we will see you in class on Monday.